from the creators who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Well, hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Wow Report, where we count down the top 10 things that made us go wow. wow. Yeah, and so today at World of Wonder, it's a holiday. It's a Friday. We're all on holiday because tomorrow is June 19th, also known as Juneteenth, which is a day celebrating the emancipation of those who were enslaved in the United States. Something we didn't learn growing up that we know now, and I love that we're taking a day off at World of Wonder to, to, to remember. Um, let's, let's jump into the countdown. Tom. Number 10. The series is over, so let's talk about it one more time. Hacks update. Boop. Hacks update. Boop, 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 boop. The third time's the charm, right? Got to talk about it. I three think times. so. No, but it, it's, it's the first show in a long time that we have all kind of enjoyed. James, have you watched yet? I have not watched it yet. No, I know. I'm so sorry. I'm so. I just finished Mayor of East Town, so I, I, I need. I need to. You're ahead of me on that one. I'm making up for James because I've watched it twice now. I watched. You've watched good. Hacks twice. Yeah, yeah. Fabulous. Okay, it is that good, huh? It really is. It all, you know, and just for those of you who suddenly, the first two episodes I thought were great. The episodes three and four I thought were horrible. The episodes five and six I thought were really, really good. And seven and eight, without overhyping it too late, were resplendent. They really delivered everything you wanted. Um, and something that was gnawing at my brain that you guys may already know that I just found out, which is a game changer, is, you know, everyone's been talking about Jean Smart and she deserves everything that's going to come her way and every award. But, you know, her co-star, who plays sort of the annoying Gen, X, Gen Z-er, who you kind of are annoyed with initially because she's just annoying, but it's a good actress, who, you know, brings on a lot of performance, a lot of different things, and is played by an actress named Hannah Einbinder. And I looked at her credits and I didn't know any of them, yet she seemed so familiar. And I just found out, maybe the last person on earth, she is Lorraine Newman, formerly of Saturday Night Live's daughter. Oh, I did know that. Yes. Did you know that, Fenton? I did know that. I, the reason I knew that is because I just recently started following Lorraine Newman out of the blue. I have no idea what what possessed me. Just I thought, what's Lorraine up to? And I started following her on Twitter about two months ago. And so she's been tweeting about this a lot. So I, I you know, I, I so love. You knew, so you knew you're in the yeah. loop. My friend John Tolens and I, I would I told him this joke and I, I it's about uh, Lorraine Newman, which she played. um in the mid 70s saturday night live it was like some tv commercial with dan Aykroyd and her and she was kind of playing anorexic before we knew the word anorexic and dan Aykroyd was kind of playing a pimp and her line that i remember she's wearing like a bodysuit with nipples like exaggerated nipples she's like i used to weigh white 110 what a lardo now i weigh 70 i want to weigh 10. and so i want to weigh 10 is my is my uh, <laughs> motto with all my friends whenever i'm dieting so i want to weigh 10. Um, and I, <laughs> I don't want the only person on the planet who remembers that commercial. I do. Who's still alive. There's lots <laughs> of people they've all passed on. Um, uh, I don't want to give it away. It's, it's, uh, it sets up for a great second season. It it's appropriately kind of, um, re redeeming for everyone. And at the same time, I think they all are still in a hot, uh, kettle of fish when this all ends. Um, and I also didn't realize, and we're running out of time, is that the powers behind it are all people that work very closely on um, on, on on Broad City. Oh, okay. So it's, it, and their names, because I can't remember anything, but Paul W. Downs, who also plays the agent, Lucy, Lucia Aniello and Jay and Stansky, and they all have lots of credits, but they've all worked on Broad City together. And it's funny, because they are perfectly perched, because they're kind of in their 30s now and a little bit experienced, so they can look over at Jen, you know, uh, Zers and make fun of them and also look at, you know, the hacks, you know, the, the Gene Smart generation and have a respect for them. So it's an, it's, it's, it was delicious and you've been told by everyone, but now you have to go see, watch it on HBO Max. Tom, what's your favorite bit of the, of the series? Do you have a favorite bit? I know what yours is. And so I, I, want, I don't want to steal it. Um, uh, I, I, I loved the episode where she, um, Hannah, the characters, uh, falls in love with the manic guy and has the most intense night of her life. And then something shocking happens because 
that feels like my love life in a in a nutshell. <laughs> I don't want to give any away. <laughs> oh, okay. And um, so I'm so glad you mentioned that you know what my what is mine. You love when Gene Smart in mid conversation just pulls out that uh, thing to fix the soda machine and she's cranking and turning and putting tubes in and out to get her soda fountain to work in her palatial kitchen. Yes. And I love the, the mansion itself. I love the mansion. It's yeah. like such a character in the whole, in the whole thing. James, you've got sure. to watch it. I will. I promise I will. Yeah, we can talk about it again next week. If you watch it. I, see, yes. I have a problem with my HBO Max though. Is that it? Every so there are times when I try and watch something and it says that I have to pay fourteen dollars, even though I have HBO. It, it makes no sense. I've got to call and figure that out. So, okay. all right, let's move on to number nine, James. Number nine. Well, I want to follow up something that we talked about last week. Uh, Tom, you weren't here for this, but we talked about uh, Yashar Yashar Ali. Uh, who is a Twitter personality, who is a, sort of a social media powerhouse. He makes or breaks stars with just a single tweet. And he, um, we were talking last week how he had been talking about his mental health decline and that he was having suicidal ideations. And every night he was tweeting, I'm going to bed and I hope I don't wake up. And he tweeted that every night for about two weeks. And there were people who were on both sides of the fence saying, yes, it's something that you definitely should be talking about. Other people were saying you're putting ideas into other people's minds, blah, blah, blah. Well, come to find out that just as we were putting the podcast or put the radio show to bed last week, there was a scandal that was breaking about Yashar Ali with um, uh, LA Magazine broke this story, this hit piece about him and everyone that lit, lit up the Twitter sphere. It turns out that he's this sort of creepy, talented Mr. Ripley-esque type character, like a Rasputin type person who is, insinuates himself into the lives of famous people. Nobody Nobody knows where he came from. Nobody knows how he got so powerful. Nobody knows where all the Twitter followers came from. And they were asking people like Jake Tapper from CNN, like, how do you know him? And how, how did you become friends? And Jake's like, I don't know. He was just in my life one day. Like, I don't quite understand how we became best friends. Then it turns out that he had been um, insinuated himself into Kathy Griffith's life and said that um, he was going to help her with build up her social media following and maybe he should move in with her. Well, he moved in with her. He went into a back room for nine months. He didn't leave the back room. She was like, how do I get rid of this, this freeloader? How do I get like it became she was terrified that this weirdo was living in her house. So all these stories keep coming up about like how he's friends with Chrissy Teigen, but Chrissy doesn't know how they became friends. And then the story became all this suicide conversation. Was it maybe to deflect from the story that was coming out? Was it maybe to gin up some sympathy because he knew that the, the people were going to turn on him? Was it, was he feeling suicidal because he knew that he was about to be, you know, uh, this hack, he was about to be, this hit piece was coming out. So Yashir Ali just, for someone who nobody knew about, you didn't know anything about him. You'd never even heard about him, Fenton. And now he's all anyone is talking about. Am I correct? I think I follow him on Twitter. Yes, he has a fascinating Twitter. He tweets 60 times a day obsessively about bedsheets and celebrities and politics. And he, uh, he's, it's a fascinating tweet, Twitter storm that he does every day. And it speaks to sort of the blur between like real Twitter people and fake Twitter people. Like if they have a voice, aren't they just Twitter people? Aren't we all just Twitter people underneath it all? Don't we all? Well, he read sells himself as being a, a political journalist and he writes for New York Magazine. And he writes for HuffPo. He has all that in his bio, but he really only wrote one story for HuffPo like five years ago. And so he, it's like he builds himself up but he really doesn't have the credentials to to back any of it. It sounds just like we should be friends with him. I'm being terrible. Has he done any harm to anyone? Is there harm in the article? Has he been well but, other than freeloading, which you know with the, the freeloading and just the, the, the general creepiness and the um and the, the the suicide thing, which people are saying is it's uh, you know I I don't know well, I don't if know. He's been living this lie, and then all of a sudden the curtains pulled on him. I could see how it would sort of upset his equilibrium 
Oh, but I'm going to dig in the modern day Rasputin and who has insinuated himself into the palace. And uh, I think that maybe there's a documentary in there somewhere in which we in which he is exposed. Maybe maybe there's another side to the story. You know, maybe it's like there's more to be revealed. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess the story is ongoing, so we shall find out. All right. Watch this space. We'll have more on Yasha Ali in weeks to come, I'm sure. OK, hold it right there. Oh, Carrot Top is going to get another prop. <laughs> Carrot Bottom. Carrot Bottom. <laughs> Where are you, Blake? I'm, oh, you in hot, I'm in Hot Springs, Arkansas. It is mom's house. And sort of do the do the camera again for Tom. Oh, Tom, you'll love that. Look. Uh, where... No, but that's there's... not what we want to see. We want to see. We don't want to see. A... Is there a kitty cat? Yes, there's a kitty cat right here. I can't find oh, it. But... That's okay. But Did I just use the... Really... Oh, oh. Carrot Top has gone to get another prop, you bet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I have. All right. So moving on to number eight. Number eight. Sometime in the mid 90s, I started noticing, and I don't know if you did too, that cars were all looking silver or sort of light gray and silver. And I, it's one of those things that once you start noticing it, you can't stop looking at all the colors of all the cars. And they were just all gray, light gray and silver. And then Wait, hold on, that, that's very interesting because I remember in the 90s when I went to Michigan, when I would go visit my mother in Michigan and they were this ugly, ugly teal color. Every car in Michigan was like a, a greenish, bluish teal. that was just hideous. Rent a car teal. We used to call that. Yes. Yes. It's a, teal is a sort of blue, right? It's a bluish green. Yeah. Mm, it's just very specific mm. to a very type of person. And, and then sort of in, in this, in the, in this century, I suppose the last 20 years, <laughs> the, the, the sort of the, all the paint colors have been very metallic and lustrous. So you sort of look into it and it's like diving into a pool of color. And the reason I'm mentioning either of these things is because I've suddenly noticed a new car color trend. And I went online to search for anything talking about it. Couldn't find anything. But have you noticed there are all these cars, all kinds of models like Porsches, even, you know, high end days, like so high and low end cars in these sort of flat grays. Oh, like, yeah. You know what that is? That's the, um, the Batmobile syndrome. Right. It's a sort of it's a sort of gray. That's a sort of a bluish gray or a greenish gray. And it's very flat. It's not reflective. It's not metallic. It's like a, it's like a primer paint coat almost. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. like, or like those, when you were a kid, you had those Airfix models and you would paint planes with, they're like almost children's toy, toy model colors. They're very sort of, and I thought, gosh, that's kind of, I kind of like that look. And then I said, so then here's my prop that you just shaded me for. I looked online and here we'll post it on the wear report is a chart that shows over the years the changing colors of cars. And you'll see in the mid nineties, this extraordinary bump in gray and black colored cars that peaked sort of in the 2004s and has sort of gradually been declining. White cars are now in the ascendancy. White cars are really coming on. But it's interesting, isn't it? That when you look at it right here, right now, blue sort of oops yeah the colorful cars <laughs> like red or blue oh my god purple no one has a purple car well actually i've been seeing a rise of orange cars lately there's an orange and a fuchsia that i've been seeing uh, a lot but i do i i i am going on record as to say that the rich billionaires all wanted to have a batmobile and the batmobile has that famous matte black it, it doesn't reflect and i think oh, you mean like actually a, sorry james you mean actually matte but i'm talking about these are glossy but they're very Mm, chalky colors. Do you know what I? That, that, oh, okay. Because I had I, you, you. Have you seen the matte cars that don't have any reflection yes. on them whatsoever? And yes. that's all billionaire boy toys. That's normally vinyl wrap. Apparently, I've been told. Oh, okay. I think everyone got conservative, or it's about retail or, or resale. But I, I've all my cars. Sadly, I fit right in. I had a red my red Volkswagen, but I've had black and gray cars. I have a black car now. When I look out my window on my street, it's all black, white, gray, black, white, gray. Yeah. I kind of think it's weird that like Range Rovers, they're all 
black, but that some are like black green or black blue. Like there's just a little tint of blue when it drives by. Huh. It's weird that it's not a black or, you know, that's their version of blue. And you think of the like the classic cars of the 50s and 60s were like pink and green and, you know, orange and rust and all that kind of uh, aesthetic is, is, is lost for this sort of austere black, white, gray. Although I think more white cars because of uh, global warming and people right need need to have a car that can that well can that's also something that that says that i'm so rich that i can afford to have my car washed every single day uh -huh. as opposed to you know people who have black cars because they don't wash their cars like me well and i've also <laughs> heard that if you have a red car you're more likely to be pulled over well that is true i thought um, that too but it is fascinating that in sort of 1994 most cars were purple blue green yellow red those sorts of colors and the, the sort of black, white, and gray was, was a tiny, was the minority. And now it's changed the other way. So James, I, I don't want to squeal on you, but isn't your car kind of purplish? <laughs> no, my, my car, car is a clown car that has about 20,000 different colors on it okay. because it's, the, but it's black underneath, but then it's got all the squiggles all over it. Oh, and bless yeah. you. <laughs> all right, moving on. Uh, let's take a break. Hmm. Blake, do you have a question? I do. Um, it's all about lakes. I'm coming to you from Lake Hamilton, which is connected to Lake Washita, which is the 82nd biggest lake in the United States. We did a houseboat trip there. I'm going to say the answer is Lake Bell. I wanted to ask, what is the biggest lake besides the Great Lakes in the United States? Uh, well, we'll have the answer right after the lake. I mean, very. Uh, uh, yeah. You're listening to Wow Report on Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back. Um, oh, by the way, before Blake gives us the answer to the question before the break, Drag Race All Stars 6 is just six days away. June 24th on Paramount Plus new home. we got Aisha Taylor, Big Frida, Charlie XCX, Emma Roberts, Jamal Sims. Who else, Tom? Oh, Tina Knowles Lawson. Tina Knowles Law. Tina Knowles Lawson. Beyonce's mom. Thank you. And Miss Piggy. The biggest star of all, Miss Piggy. Yeah. The only guest star who's ever come on the show that makes me think that maybe RuPaul could be replaced would be Miss Piggy. If Miss Piggy came in and filled Ru's shoes. Please, Miss Piggy's Drag Race. Yes. <laughs> I've never seen them in the same room. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I asked a question. I'm coming to you from Lake Hamilton. And I wanted to know, what is the biggest lake in the United States besides the Great Lakes? I'm going to say it's either Salt Lake, Lake Okeechobee, or... Um, uh, the Sultan, Sultan, uh, no, Sultan I'm not what it's the Great Salt Lake, yes, yes, oh, yes, makes sense. makes sense. Interesting. Well, it, it couldn't be Sultan Sea, could it? Because that's the sea, or is it a lake? I think it's well, a lake, isn't it? And didn't it go away? I so think it comes away. and goes depending on the rains. Oh, okay. Sometimes Blake's questions raise more questions than deliver <laughs> answers. <laughs> I want to keep you on your toes and thinking. Always, always room to learn. Always le le learn to. How many people named Lake can you mention? <laughs> Lake, Lake Bell. Uh huh. Um, Lake Lively. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving along. <laughs> moving right along. <laughs> Gee. Uh, okay, we're counting down top 10 things that made us go, wow, we've reached number seven. Number seven. Uh, wow, for me, is that. We are starting to take our masks off in Los Angeles. The mask, the public mask thing is, is off. You can take them off. Um, in productions so far, we're keeping our masks on. Same policy as we had last year because, you know, they're waiting for the unions and everybody to come up with a, you know, a plan. No one's rushing into anything. You know, it's, I work out in a gym now without a mask. I feel Ow, okay about it. Don't I'm do vaccinated. It. I'm vaccinated, by the way. Um, but and you can still carry it, for God's sake. I do have it with me, believe me. Oh, oh we don't. <laughs> Who cares? No, but you, you, they say it's too low. So the exciting part of that was that uh, the fabulous Stephen Colbert 
was back at the Ed Sullivan Theater on the stage with a full audience, oh. full capacity. Everyone had been vaccinated. And it was a joyous moment. Oh, did, no. Did you guys see it no. by any chance? I'm there's I'm good. not down with this. No, there's still the Indian variant. There's still there's still deadly uh, Delta variant. James. The Delta yeah. variant. Yes, there's still things that are that are incubating in in faraway places. That, are, that people say that we've had three waves, four waves. We haven't. We've had one wave, and there's potentially another wave still to come. I think that this is a death trap. That everybody is going out. They, they're going. To, I I talked to someone. I'm not going to name names, but they work at World of Wonder, and I talked to them today, and they. They had gone to a nightclub, a busy, busy nightclub the night before. And I said, don't do it. What do you, th it's, it's madness. It's going to, it's, it's going to backfire on everybody. I'm sorry. I just well, had to put that out there. I have a confession to make. I got my hair cut professionally for the first time in months and months and years, you know, since the pandemic. And I realized this is way, this is a really, I'm really being vulnerable. You guys. It was the most someone had touched me <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> since March. It's like I wanted to marry the guy, straight dude, totally appropriate. I didn't do anything. But like he was this cleaning thing, touching my neck and wrapping my face in a hot towel. I was like, oh, my God, I have not been touched <laughs> in a fortnight or whatever that means. But uh, anyway, the Colbert show was a hoot. The, the, the cutest moment was he had Jon Stewart on and, and, and he had all of the staff. You know he has that dome with all that he can change the over the audience. He can change the picture. He you know oftentimes looks at the Sistine Chapel. He had every staff member from late night because you know who kept the show alive. Well, because even though he was gone, the show was still going on. And he had his wife kind of pass the baton because she sort of had been there. He'd been doing a lot of the shows from his house with her holding the camera and helping him. And so she just reminded everyone that's to take, just sort of giving Stephen back to us. And please remember to laugh. He needs it. So it was really cute. But, um, and I'm looking, I'm looking forward to reopening. I, I I'm willing to believe in my most cynical, not just precautionary mind that we may, you know, like when we were in New Zealand, Fenton, it was mass sauce, everything was fine. And then there'd be some breakout and they would go back into lockdown. So that might happen, but, but do you honestly believe that the way that the world is right now, the way that the Republicans are and the way that the Fox viewers are, that they will ever agree to ever go back into lockdown again, no matter how bad it gets, no, but we it, can, it, I can. Because I, you know, I, I follow, I go to Daily Mail all the time and I read the comments and, and there are very right wing extreme. I don't know if they're Russian bots. I don't know what they are, but they are all Trumpers and Trumpets. And every time they talk about the Delta variant or what's happening in India, every single comment, there are about 3000 comments and every single one is I am sick of this bullshit. It is not real. It is. We are not going into lockdown, blah, blah, blah. And it, they it, one after the other saying that, please, I, if nobody ever mentions COVID, COVID again, it will be too soon. And there's just this denial that is happening in people's heads that it's over and that we never have to talk about it again. And I think that's dangerous. Well, it feels very human to go into denial after something hard and people get tired of things. I just, I mean, we've survived it and I'm not being cavalier about that because who knows, maybe it just didn't come close to us. But I, I think we are prepared as a society, like production is prepared to go into COVID safety. Uh, you know, we can work from home. I'm looking forward to the day that we can all sit together. I don't know if James will ever let that happen again, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. I have a gift for you guys when we get together. I've been saving it. I mean, James, how do you feel about us gathered around that table in the window? Not with, our for... with our mouth on those big black mics that have been used by hundreds of drag queens before us. Yeah, right. Yeah, but remember that lovely mic smell of just saliva <laughs> of <brown laughs> people Lipstick. before you? <laughs> um, I will revisit this conversation in September. Very All good. Right. That's fair. Okay. That's fair, James. Okay. What have you got for us at number six, James? Number six. Well, talk about being touched and touching yourself and having people touch you. Uh, I want to talk about the return of Jeffrey Tubin to CNN, which happened this week. It was shocking and out of the blue. I don't know if you recall, uh, eight months ago, Political commentator Jeffrey Tubin was caught lubing the Tubin, as they say, and uh, he was masturbating in full view of everybody on a Zoom call to his New Yorker com comrades. And he says that it was a mistake, and he was immediately fired from New Yorker and put on um, 
sort of semi-permanent leave at CNN. Well, all of a sudden this week I turned on CNN and there he was. And he was talking to uh, CNN anchor Allison Camerati. And she was sort of setting the path and setting the table so that he could tell, you know, have, have this comeback. And he said, you know, it was a mistake. I was, it was the most moronic thing I've ever done. I'm very sorry. And then she said, well, that's fine. And then he started talking about the situation with Biden in Russia. But if it was a mistake, how can it be moronic? I mean, a mistake is a mistake. Well, and, he's covering then, all his bases is what he's right, doing. Right, because then, and then, and then what difference does it make whether it was a mistake or intentional, right? I mean, does it make any difference? The, the point is, and I'm not being judgy here. I, I mean, yeah. masturbate all you like. I'm just saying, well, does it make any difference whether it was a mistake or intentional? But he has, I mean, there are people, especially Fox News, went absolutely bananas about the story and saying that um, how you can't uh, you can't uncancel somebody for this. But Fox News is all about not canceling people. They aren't. Yeah. They, they don't have a consistent. They've got. They've got. This. They've got skin in the game. That they're not yeah, impartial yeah. about anything, especially a CNN reporter. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I mean, you're absolutely right, Fenton, in that he was masturbating in his own house. And it, that's, you know, who, who and it, the, if the camera was accidentally on, then, you know, someone got an eyeful and whatever. It's just it's it really is. It's just someone masturbating. It's, he didn't murder his grandmother. He didn't do anything that nobody else doesn't do. He just happened to get. And if so, so someone saw a penis, for God's sakes, what the what is the world is not going to end because you saw Jeffrey Tubin's tube. And what about how does this compare with the Kim Kardashian sex tape? But that, exactly, like, and, and why why is he not getting a reality show out of it? He should get right. it, you know. <laughs> well, if maybe you not. His sisters, you'd know. His sisters aren't telegenic like he is. <laughs> I've always liked Jeffrey too, but I thought he was smart. I look forward to what he had to say for years and years since OJ trial and on. Yeah, I, I could so easily see how you could make that mistake. Just I mean, we we're, we're living no, but we're living in an age where you're. I mean, you've. I think we've all left our cameras on without knowing it. I don't think. I, don't I think did we, just the other day after yes. after our podcast. I wandered in front of it in my underwear and went, "Oh my god!" Thinking right. that Blake was seeing, you know, my not nibbly bits. But uh, <laughs> but I, I and I I think if he did it deliberately, if he were like some kind of person who exposed himself or something, that could be. Um, you know, something he needed to seek treatment for, but just well, he does being, say that he's seeing therapy, you know, he's seeing a therapist, blah blah, yeah. and he's you know, gone, he wants to, he went to rehab, I think, for some sort of sex addiction, whatever. But, but it's, it's sex not that addiction. Big. I don't even know. come on, exactly. So, I mean, welcome back, Jeffrey Tubin. You know, yes. glad to see you again. Now, just don't do it again or yes, do it again. Your- I don't really care. Yeah. Use a different computer for your masturbating. And That's a wise computer. tip. That, that is sort of the weird thing because it's like the call is just, you know, it, they're, they're still on and he's already pulling it out. Like, I mean, I don't have the urge to pull it out right now. In, with the, Like, there's no way I'm getting horny thinking about with being uh, with you. I guys. thought I was like catnip to you, James. I thought you were just... <laughs> We're going into a weird place. Let's move along. <laughs> hurry, right, hurry. Number five. <laughs> number five. Um, Wondery is a you know a podcast sort of uh, what do you say podcast platform, and they have this series. Uh, Even the rich. I think I might have mentioned it once before. Yeah. I listened to the Versace series, four podcasts, all about Gianni Versace, and of course, you know he was assassinated. Uh, on the front steps of his Miami South Beach mansion in 1997. Uh, he was a very close friend of Princess Di's and Elton John and Madonna. Fabulous designer, of course, famous in my world for Versace in Showgirls, the, the reference mm-hmm. to when Nomi says Versace instead of Versace. You know, Versace, it's a shibboleth of our times, right? And, um, but I've always kind of had a soft spot for Versace, but I did feel that the story was a little overdone and, you know, Ryan Murphy did it as one of his series. But this podcast is fascinating because it begins with the murder, as, of course, I guess you have to. But the question that comes to your mind then is, well, how did the House of Versace keep going with the death of its inspiration and founder member? And it's a story really about the brother, Santo Versace, and Donatella Versace, and they are fascinating. 
And yeah. this was oh, yeah. a family, this was a family business. And Gianni and Donatella's relationship was just, I mean, they were at each other's throats all the time, but clearly inseparable. And she was sort of his muse and she knew how to make everything better. But then when the whole responsibility of her inheriting the, well, actually twist, huge twist. I didn't know this. The family fights were so intense in the lead up to his death. And by the way, I will just tell you another parenthetical thing is that shortly before his death, Demi Moore gave a tarot reading to Donatella Versace. And the final card was the death card. And shortly after that, he was murdered. Anyway, I am going somewhere with this, which is that the fights, the family fights between the brother who did the finance and Donatella who did the accessories and Gianni were so intense that shortly before he died, he drew up a new will. He went to his lawyer and said, I don't want my brother and sister inheriting the house of Versace. And he left it all to his niece, who happened to be 11 years old, so she was too young. And so Donatella ended up taking up the reins as a sort of guardian. And oh, this is Allegra, right? Yes. And she was, yeah. Donatella was so overwhelmed by this task and this burden. She had these issues with um, cocaine addiction and what have you, um, that it was a very dark few years. And I tell you, I was in floods of tears by the time they get to the final episode and Allegra turns 18. So it's her 18th birthday, big celebration, but also the moment at which she takes control of the Versace empire. And I don't wow. know if you know this, but Elton John shows up. He wasn't invited to the birthday party, but he shows up, draws the family into the library and says, and they did an intervention. And Elton says, Elton says, there is a jet waiting for you to take you to rehab. Who? And in that moment, Allegra gave up her 18th birthday party for her mother for this intervention. She, Donatello, went off to rehab, got clean, came out, took control, back control of Versace. I mean, it's just the most amazing story with a happy ending. And I, I never but knew it isn't so much a happy ending because um, Allegra has many demons and problems as well. I don't know if you oh. follow what goes on with Allegra, but that's a whole other podcast in and of itself. I, I do not know, but I, I think it's a fascinating story. I and like I Donatella. Like... I'm a big Donatella fan. I think she's absolutely fantastic. Right. And I love the Maya Rudolph. I will always, that is one of my favorite things on, C on Saturday Night Live forever when she does Donatella Versace. Did you ever meet her, James? No, I remember um, Johnny when I lived in South Beach when he had just bought the mansion and he was, mm. I would see him everywhere. Um, but I don't think I ever met Donatella, no. Um, th this series is is only the rich. There's an amazing section where they talk about Johnny spending spree. And I think in a few months he just spent twenty three million dollars. I mean, God, don't you wish? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, so let's take a break. Um, Blake, have you got a question? I do have a question. How many states um, recognize Juneteenth? as either a state holiday or ceremonial holiday, a day of observance? We will have the answer to this question from Blake by the lake after the break. <laughs> I know, I've been working on that. All right, we'll be right back. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. And welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton here with Tom and James St. James and Blake by the lake. And Ike. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm at my mom's house in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Yeah. And I asked a question earlier. How many states recognize Juneteenth as either a state holiday or ceremonial holiday, which is a day of observance? I'm afraid it's a low number. I'm afraid to say. I want to believe it's 50, but I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go high to be wrong, but I'm going to say 45 states. I'm going to say 30, 35. 23. It's actually 47. Oh, that's good to hear. We are counting down the top 10 things that made us go wow this past week. We've reached number four. Number four. I have a new musical obsession, a new old musical obsession. As you know, about a year ago, I saw Tanya Tucker and she came out with that album with Brandi Carlisle and she won all the... And I 
flew to Nashville and she won Grammys and I just love her. And there may or may not be a Tanya Tucker piece of music on the upcoming All Star Six that you talked about, Fenton. We'll talk mm -hmm. more about that later. But mm -hmm. another a classic, classic act, Marilyn McCoo and oh. Billy Davis Jr. <laughs> are yeah. still alive, are still together. They started off in the fifth dimension, had hit after hit after hit, and Grammy after Grammy after Grammy. One of my you mom's albums. You fly in my beautiful balloon. That's right. And and they came out, and, and then they had solo six, you know, as a duet. They, they had, you know, you don't have to be a star baby to be in my show, and they were very uh -huh. big in the 70s. And she went on to host, uh, uh, after Dionne Warwick, Solid Gold. Solid Gold with Andy Gibb. Yes, it was One of the most beautiful Andy. women with the most beautiful voices in the face of the earth. Well, they just released a new album a couple months ago, and I am loving it. You know, sometimes you were like, are a little worried, like, what could it be? It's called Blackbird, Marilyn McCoo, and Billy Davis Jr., uh, Lennon McCartney icons. So they have taken the Lennon McCartney songbook and recorded them as kind of sort of jazz fusion, which I know turns you off when you hear that, but it's like it's like going to an excellent jazz club and sitting right up front and Marilyn McCoo and Billy David Jr. singing. And but isn't it sort of like, it, it's a little bit elevator music-y, but in the best sense, it's sort well, of I was like, afraid it was going to be that way or just missing something. First of all, Billy Davis Jr. sounds exactly the same on the record. Good. And Marilyn still has the most beautiful voice on earth, but it's funny how women's voices sometimes get a little bit of a, a thick a husk to them. Do you know what I'm saying? As they grow sure. older. And it always makes me think, it makes me feel so guilty. I felt this way the first time I saw Steve and Edie perform in the 90s in Vegas. Because Steve's up there singing and he sounds exactly the same as he did in the 50s. You know, men, we go through puberty, we live, and then we die. And women, <laughs> like, like, go through puberty, menstruate, have children, hormones, you know, menopause, all the things that women go through uh, backwards and in heels. But Marilyn's still incredibly musical. There's um, Their opening track is Got to Get You Into My Life. Which borrows is my a, a lot of its duets, and it um, borrows a lot from the um, Earth, Wind, and Fire version from the uh, Sgt. Pepper's Only Heart Club Band in the seventies. Love that. That's my. I I like the Sgt. Pepper with Bee Gees and Peter Frampton yeah. better than the actual Beatles version. But the standout track is Blackbird by Paul McCartney. Blackbird singing in the stead of night. Take your broken wings and learn to fly. It is, she's transferred it into like a, um, a black anthem about, uh, you know, uh, about rising in adversity. It's, it, somebody, some people are, are, um, are comparing it to sort of like Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday. It has this whole new meaning, which was always kind of there, but the fact that she's singing it and the arrangement and her voice and the wisdom and uh, uh, anyway, Again, I, I, th these things can be so cringy, but you know, Cher did ABBA, and now Marilyn McCoo and Billy Davis Jr. have done the Beatles, and it's really something to listen to. I'm scared to say if I don't show up next week, it's because I now have um, um, Alexa in my bedroom and I listen to music at night because you know, no one touches me, so I'm just like, Alexa, play Marilyn McCoo, Blackbird. <laughs> can uh, you say, Alexa, touch me now? <laughs> Well, speaking of Alexa, make sure to turn off your sidewalk feature if you don't want to share your Wi-Fi with your neighbors. I will. There's so much to learn. Yeah, you go into your Amazon uh, app, and then you go to settings, and then you scroll down to the sidewalk share feature and turn it off. Unfortunately, I missed you after you said go to your, and I was just like, I didn't know. I'll help. All he heard help was share, and he started thinking of share songs. And share. And the last thing I'm going to say is, you know, as we're talking about the world getting normal and taking masks off, I bought tickets to see Meryl McCoo and Billy Davis live in Vegas in October. That's so fantastic. I can't I, just wait. as the lockdown was happening, there was um, uh, in February of last year, Sean Cassidy was performing in Vegas on Valentine's Day. And I wanted to go so bad, but I was uh. already afraid to fly. So I didn't go. But there are so many, there's just so many wonderful concerts to see out there anyway. I can't wait. All right, to see let's it. move on. Number three, James. Number three. 
if it says here what it says. Yes, I know. I'm being filthy. There's got to, we're going to have to slap an R rating on this episode. If you've got children, now is the time to change the channel because I want to talk about uh, Harley Quinn, which is an animated show that we've talked about many times before. Um, it's one of my favorite series on television is Harley Quinn, the you know Batman villain. And it's an animated cartoon, but it is famous for pushing the envelope and it is filthy there is sex there is there is uh all sorts of she's dropping f-bombs left and right they are talking filthy she ends up having a relationship with poison ivy she has a lesbian relationship with poison ivy and it's very heated and uh, everything well what happened uh, we discovered that they um there was going to be in season the upcoming season three that there was going to be a scene in which Batman uh, orally pleasures Catwoman and uh, goes down on her, so to speak. And DC put their foot down and they said, no, 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 by God, Batman does not have oral sex. Batman, there is no way that this can happen. You cannot do this. Um, heroes don't do that was the, was the quote. And Harley Quinn producers went back and they said, do you mean to tell me that all heroes are selfish lovers, that they don't give anything <laughs> back? And they said, DC came back and they said, no, listen, we are in the business of selling toys. It is not about, it is not about the movies. It is not about the television shows. We are in the business of selling toys and we cannot sell toys if Batman is eating pussy. Oh, so she, he has to use a sex toy. Is that the idea? He has to use a, a vibrator or no, a no, 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 he's, he's just not those out. kind of toys, Fenton. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. He's just eating her out is what it is. And and there, the, the scene is he's just going to town on her, on her nether region. And they said that no, DC is in the business of selling toys to children. And if Batman is just known for eating pussy, then they, they, that makes it our job so much harder. Um, so it's um, the, the Twitter just went bananas with this and people were taking sides and everything. And there was a very funny meme. There are a hundred memes about this, about Batman and which, which heroes, you know, would eat pussy and which ones would not. And there were, there were lists of the different Batman who, which ones would and which one wouldn't. And they would say Adam West, definitely. He's a dirty bird. Yes. He would, he would definitely do it. Michael Keaton, probably not. Uh, Christian Bale is too selfish to do it. He would just he would he would want it for himself. He would just uh, yell at it. <laughs> George Clooney would do, would definitely do it. Val Kilmer would definitely do it. Um, uh, and Ben it Affleck, like they all would do it. Yeah, Ben Affleck, they said would do it like it was his job. Like that was like they. And then uh, Robert Pattinson would definitely do it. Not do it because he's too, such a petulant child. And he, he would definitely so so everybody has their ideas about which Batman and then like would Tony Stark do it would Iron Man do it would Daredevil like you know every all everyone who is is you know one people were wondering where they would land on the oral sex issue. <sighs> I love it. I love that, you know, there can be all these violence in these cartoons and all this craziness, but you get to sex stuff and people. And that's where we draw the toys. line. Can't yes. sell toys. They can sell adult toys. I like, I like where Fenton was going. Kind of like a, an Iron Man vibrator. <laughs> I'm sure there is such a thing. You know, I'm sure there's some superhero <laughs> sex toys, just not officially licensed. There's a couple other tweets that say, if Batman doesn't um, give head, then what? Then who was that at um, Comic Con three years ago? Who? You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Um, moving on to number two. There's no segue for this. Number two. Um, catch and kill. The uh, trailer dropped uh, for Catch and Kill this week. And Catch and Kill is a new doc series from World of Wonder. Um, and it's based on Ronan Farrow's best-selling book, Catch and Kill, and also on his podcast. And it sort of builds on that. And in six half hours, it tells the story of how Ronan brought the truth about uh, Harvey Weinstein, fought to report the truth, uh, the ugly truth about Harvey Weinstein. And... Um, if I do say so myself, it's pretty amazing uh, and really fascinating, especially the the courage of the people who came forward and who spoke to Ronan. The, the series begins with a woman called Amber Gutierrez, who years before Weinstein was exposed, was asked by the New York police to wear a wire. And she did. 
um, because he had assaulted her in a meeting in his office and he wanted to meet up with her again and she wore a wire to that meeting. And it's a chilling, um, the, the series has the wire, the tape, the audio, and it's an amazing story of how she, well, she took it on the chin, really. She got a lot of, uh, you know, she, she wore the wire and then she thought, well, the police are now going to proceed and charges will be brought and nothing happened. And then suddenly there were all these articles in the press about Amber Gutierrez and her relationship with the prime minister of Italy, kind of smearing her and suggesting she was a prostitute and a woman of ill repute. Very long story short. She reached a settlement with Harvey Weinstein, or rather Harvey Weinstein reached out to, to force her to settle. And she was required to give up the tape. And don't want to give it away. Great twist by which she ended up having a copy of the tape. She made her own personal copy, not just the copy that was done for the police wire, and managed to uh, retain one copy of her own copy. And then um, brilliantly managed to give it to Ronan without actually giving it to Ronan. Uh, she just played it back to him and he ran out and got a tape recorder and recorded it. So she hadn't given, given the file to anyone. It's an amazing story. And there are many more stories in the series like that. Um, and it's amazing how- Ronan. Tell me, tell me what, you, what you thought of him. Uh, was Ronan is a, so formidable. He's, he's just brilliant. And so sort of dogged and clear and, um, just also very compassionate. Um, and it really was a struggle to get this story out. There were many, many people, I guess, who just didn't want the story out there. And it was, it was, it was even before Ronan, reporters had tried to cover this story and it had proved really impossible. So um, that is Catch and Kill. It's a new series. It's streaming on HBO Max from July 12th, and it's gonna be back to back. So there's gonna be two episodes dropping once a week from July 12th for three weeks. I can't wait to watch. Thank you, Tom. I think it's, 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 it's good. Okay. I mean, you think about the last few years and all the social change, and it, it didn't officially start with the Me Too movement, Ronan, but like it was the beginning of major change. We look at everything differently now, so I'm fascinated to see how it all began. Well, definitely the Harvey Weinstein story did sort of trigger the Me Too movement, didn't it? It definitely, right. It definitely yeah. was the sort he's, of. He's, the, he's one of the great characters. He's one of the great, not not Harvey, but Ronan is one of the most interesting people of the last ten years, I think. And I think I just read uh, that that Harvey Weinstein can now be extradited to California to Los to face Angeles. Yeah. charges here in LA. Yeah. All right, let's take one more break. And when we come back, we'll reveal the number one thing that made us go wow this week. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton here with Tom and James. And we've been counting down the top 10 things that make us go wow. And wow. we have reached number one. Number one. Benton, this is your story to tell. You tip me off about it. It is a story, may I say, of biblical proportions. Yeah. Jonah think, and the whale revisited. Well, right. But, I mean, did you ever hear of, I mean, we all know the story of Jonah and the whale. Jonah was swallowed by a whale. But did you ever hear of it happening in real life? Yes, it happened to Pinocchio. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I think of that song, it ain't necessarily so. What you read in the Bible, although it's not libel, it ain't necessarily so. They say like Jonah was, you know, lived in a whale. It's like, really? So, but this happened on what, Cape Cod? That's right, Cape Cod, Michael Packard. No, Michael Packard. I'm sorry, how did I, I don't know what's on dare there. you? Well, Michael you said Packard. that because it actually happened in Provincetown, which is the gay area of Cape Cod. Mm. Did it? Okay. Mm. Was, was he a so gay? Michael Packard was puckered by he was, um his by pucker a, was his pucker was uh, <laughs> a humpback whale, a humping back whale. No, he, and the thing is, look, let me tell you, the thing about humpback whales, because I was fascinated, is that they open their mouths really, really wide, and they're taking in all this krill, and because their mouths are so wide, they can't see where they're going. <laughs> I get that. I get that. That happens to me. <laughs> and Michael says he ha it felt a huge bump, and then everything went completely black, and he was in the whale. 
It's so and creepy. He said he thought about his kids who are, you know, like young teenagers, and he thought this was it. Um, and he began to struggle. And I guess that like after 30 or 40 seconds, the whale had just had enough and spat him back out. It's incredible. I think his sons were either, he was scuba diving, right? And it yeah. sounds like the whale was just doing what the whale does. He's kind of the wrong place at the wrong time. But hearing the interview, cause he was on WCVB TV channel five, Boston, where I grew up watching. And he like, he was had all this presence of mind. He's like, oops, cause he could breathe. He was in the whale, but he had his scuba equipment. So he's like, well, I wonder how long I'm going to be here. I have like, you know, a half hour before this runs out. And then he ended up getting spit out. And I think his son saw him get spit out. So like, can you imagine being him? Can you imagine being the sons knowing that your father's in a whale? It's just, it is a tremendous story with a happy ending. Except for the whale who got nothing out of it. Nothing. Well, well he's famous was, now. He's a very famous whale. So, <laughs> well, the whale is in. a pub. The whale is a public anemone. <laughs> I like it. No, I like okay. it. The right, puff a, daddy. I thought you were going to say puff daddy. I didn't know yes, it's, it's a squid pro quo. Uh huh. <laughs> his favorite DJ is Skrillex. Yes. In fact, he's released an album called Krilla. <laughs> his stage name is Mackerel Jackson. <laughs> and this just says to me why I only go into pools that go up to my knee it's just, true it's true i don't go there's too many things in the we we are in their home you know i know, and I know the odds are really uh, you know everything will be okay well that's it just is, it. the odds are in your favor until they aren't and then you know <laughs> and then what do you do it's like the, you know, though, the odds are in your favor until they're not <laughs> he's a fascinating guy because he also survived a, an open water scenario where you know he was scuba diving and the boat left him behind, and he was just in the open water for hours before they were like, oops, and managed to find him. And, and at what point do you, when these things keep happening to you over and over, do you say, it's time to hit the pool? Like, I, I, I am right. done with or, the ocean. Or even better, why don't you start bowling? You know, join a bowling league. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> he went to South America. You're right. He stuck to the land. He went to South America. And he was in a plane crash in which everyone else died. This man and he was in the to just stay home and watch some TCM. You know? Now I don't believe the story. Now I think this guy's making stuff up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all we got time for. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Tom. Thank, Thank you, James. You. Thank you, Blake. Um, same time, same place next week. Until then, go out and do something. Rip off your mask if regulations allow. Uh, <laughs> do something that makes the world go wow. Wow. wow.